guys, I want to engage you in a conversation about the music of movies, and, and specifically the music of uh, Star Trek. Tell me who you think was the giant of uh, Star Trek's music. I, I think it's safe to say that most composers look to Jerry Goldsmith for inspiration. They look to him for what was possible, what he created, what he did to create a, uh, such a, an incredible array of palette and world of sounds that so many composers thereafter have kind of leaned on what he did. Um, and I think they would all, they probably all agree with that. And of course, and he, Alexander Courage, who wrote the, the original the, the main theme. The original theme. theme. Uh, was Jerry Goldsmith a, an, an innovator, do you think? I think he was the innovator. Um, he taught all of us what was possible in music. He was the fan of avant-garde and he was the fan of traditional at the same time. Give me an example that appears in The Ultimate Voyage of something innovative that Jerry Goldsmith uh, wrote. Sure, well I think one of the, the most iconic sounds that has come from the motion picture is this wonderful blaster beam instrument that he invented along with a well-known percussionist here in Los Angeles. He invented this instrument to sound like it was a, a giant set of lasers exploding on, on impact and he created it out of a giant metal can and long bass strings and he'd slam it on the bass strings and ultimately created this amazing blaster beam sound and it became you know later on in the film part of the sound design so that's one of the the, the great things that you'll hear on the stage with the concert and um, you know it's a long list of those types of things. What was your thinking uh, and writing uh, and, and uh, making this a form of Star Trek uh, episodes? I look back on, on that amount of time and that amount of material and instead of focusing on specific events or people or memories, I thought of the ideas that bubbled out of that much material and then tried to build the show around themes that those ideas captured and then set a piece of music to each one of those. Themes. Can you give me an example of what the audience will see when they go see The Ultimate Voyage? Man versus machine, as we were talking about before, man versus himself, man versus man, but also the real simple stuff like close bonds and love and loss, and it would be no different 300, 400 years from now than it is today. For me, one of the fascinating things about Star Trek is how many different things there are in this franchise that we can all connect to as humans. We, there's something in it for everybody that, you know, whether or not it's, as Brady pointed out, love and loss, or whether or not it's, it's the, the, the fun of life forms, which is one of the themes, you know, tracing the fun little critters and life forms across 50 what years. What a great idea. You know, set to Leonard Rosamond's great music from Star Trek IV, you know, the, the, uh, the end title. Or whether or not it's, you know, uh, again, as Brady mentioned, Close Bonds being set to Jay Chataway's music from the Inner Light episode, or going straight to the Amok Time Battle, you know, all this, this amazing music. Because some of the greatest tunes written in entertainment history have been written for the Star Trek franchise, you know, not to mention, of course, not the least of which is Alexander Courage's uh, amazing main theme from the first episode of Star Trek. There should be a homogenous reaction to each of our edits if we chose the music correctly. Some people have said, wow, I, I can't believe that that piece of music was part of the Star Trek world. It was so familiar to my childhood or culture, I didn't know it was written for Star Trek. Wow. And that will happen a lot in the show, I think. Some of these pieces are so moving and so powerful. Um, now, we untraditionally set them against new imagery. So, Of course, the people are who go to the theater to see The Ultimate Voyage are going to have a unique experience. In a way, by isolating the uh, picture on the screen, there's a giant 40-foot screen upon which the images of the scene, the scene itself, is played on the screen. On the stage is a live orchestra. So you're forced to look at the orchestra and see the, the players, and, and, and the music becomes more uh, perceptive. You can see the music as against just hearing it, and you're seeing the image. So you're dealing with a multi-level of experiences in The Ultimate Voyage. One of the unique things about any concert environment is that you have an opportunity to experience it live in person. Mm -hmm. But the added bonus of, of, of having 50 years of one of the most iconic franchises um, in entertainment history with some of the most iconic music ever written for entertainment, um, 
there's that element, but the idea of having those elements in front of you and then it becoming part of a shared experience with, you know, in some halls, 2,500, 3,000 other people sitting around you, it elevates what your memories were, what they are of the series, yeah. what they could have been of the music, and it changes your perception on, on what things mean to you emotionally. We did a show in, uh, in Paris, and uh, after the show, uh, I saw a kid get up out of the audience and walk to the front of the stage and take pictures of uh, one of the instruments, I think it was an oboe. Because um, I think for the first time he connected physically the fact that this fascinating classical instrument was responsible for creating music that was responsible for part of his love of the movie. Wow. And it, I think we take for granted that people will make the connection. And by extracting the orchestra and putting them in their, their proper place in front of, of, the, of the moments they helped create the magic for, I do hope that, that some of that physical connection, like you're mentioning, is, is made. Uh, one of the, the great things f for me um, from the original series is the, the amount of escapism that composers had to be responsible for creating through their music to what convince do you mean by that? well to convince people watching the show that they were on another planet that you know these mm. these otherwise plastic characters became real in our ears and in our minds and in our spirits because of what the music helped them to feel. So are you saying because we all know that music enhances the mood. But are you saying that it also enhances like reality or unreality? I think it can. I, I think that great music um, in any situation can help place us in a time and place, sometimes even timeless and placeness, um, you know, where we, we find that we, ha we have an avenue through which to connect ourselves in a way that we can. It's, it's a language that we all speak, you know, whether or not, we, you know, I speak Swahili or you speak German, we both speak music because we know how to listen to it and we know how to feel and react emotionally and that's what a composer's job really is is to take what's happening on screen that you can't see on screen and give that to the audience you know the description that reminds me we do a, a piece that explores the holodeck and dreams and how technology can allow you to explore your imagination in star trek and there's a great piece of music set to the juxtaposition of the dream sequences in all of star trek that kind of captures what justin was talking about it's it's not of this time it's not of this place it's not of the future it's not of the past it's just sort of exist in this netherworld of possibility which a lot a lot of Star Trek was about possibility. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it is a unique experience. The music of Star Trek, the scenes of Star Trek, all thematically put together. It's not just unusual, it's unique. Experience. 50 years of Star Trek, the music live on stage at a city near you.